Welcome to iStat's aviation video series sponsored by PwC. These podcasts and videos are designed to talk with aviation industry leaders and influencers about activities and what's going on in the industry at the moment. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Peter Chang. Peter is the CEO of CDB Aviation. Peter, lovely to have you with us. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. See, Peter, this year has been a transformational year for CDB Aviation. You've emerged with a, an international new management team, a, a top 10 lessor now with over 200 aircraft currently in the fleet, plus another over 200 on order, bringing you to 400 plus aircraft. Would you like to give us and the audience some insight on both yourself and CDB Aviation? Indeed, it, it has been a very exciting year. Um, it's amazing that we started what we will consider as a CDB 3.0, since last December, that it's been it's been actually 15 months that we have increased the platform for, from approximately 28 employees, 28 professionals, to close to 100. If you would have asked me the same question a year ago, I would probably think that it's a pipe dream. So so we're very we're very grateful and and very humble to have the type of not only the numbers of the professionals in the, in the business to join us. Um, but also these are fairly senior people that, that we were very, very surprised that in the industry where talents are typically known as very difficult to find, that we were able to attract so many talents. So in terms of CDB Bank, it has a responsibility in the mission, uh, not only doing in terms of facilitating national projects domestically, such as financing the nuclear power plants and financing the highways and, and, and infrastructure projects. They also extended to, as recently with One Bell One Road program, has becoming the financial arm for the state into the international arena. It became involved with aviation leasing primarily because the aviation industry was considered by the Chinese government is one of the core strategic industries. So when aviation came along that they want to make sure that they have one of their stronger financial cornerstones to be part of the industry. So if you talk more specifically on CDB Aviation, say you've over 200 aircraft in the fleet now, many aircraft on order. What's your vision? Where do you see CDB leasing being in, or CDB Aviation leasing being in five years and then 10 years time in terms of numbers? When the, the business model, which which we did, I discussed with the, our board members in the very beginning, was that in view of the comparative advantage of the CDB bank, we, the questions were what were the most suitable scale for ownership like a CDB. So considering we have 185 airplanes at a time, that we want to get to a level, not necessarily the fleet size, but in terms of a fleet size where where it would necessitate a platform. So at the time, what we said was uh, 600 airplanes, first stop. The reason for 600 airplanes, and not necessarily because investment grades, it went from 200 to 300 to 400, now I think it's about, for investment grades, 600. Okay. So, so not to be confused with that, um, but 600 was a, a, it was a round number in a sense where we can develop a team that's had to scale and the reach to achieve a certain level of relevance. Relevance in the, science, in the same that you have ad adequate size of the commercial origination team. You will have a size of a, a technical asset management team and, and so on, where you achieve the highest level of relevance, whether it's to the customer point of view whether it is to OEM point of view, that you could get to this scale where your pricing can be effective. So, and that was the right, 
using the, the benchmark, we think it would be right around 150 to 175 employees where it could adequately would support a 600 airplane fleet. Uh, that's part of it. Okay. And speaking of the target, I think people will be interested in your, your kind of the planned fleet mix of wide bodies, narrow bodies. I think at the moment you've a, maybe a handful or less of, of, of 777s and a, a similar number on order of 787-9. What's the, of the 600 planes, do you have any particular strategy around percentage of wide bodies, narrow bodies, or what you're thinking on, on wide body orders in the future? Well, we, we want to be a full-scale operating lessor, and, and being full-scale means that we, we, we want to be able to engage with all type of airlines. And by definition, that means we, 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 we will maintain a wide-body fleet, although that I would not underestimate that some of the typical issues with wide-body. It's riskier. And, and so on, smaller operator base, it contributes to the risk part. Um, so we, w we have a very cautious approach in the process of growing to it. Our goal is we probably, for, lack of, for the lack of the precise, I think generally speaking, we follow the rules of having 10% of our fleet in, in numbers, in white bodies, which roughly translates to 30-35% in terms of value. Okay, good. And then in terms of trading of aircraft, obviously most successful platforms have had an active trading strategy. Uh, would you mind explaining your, your trading strategy in the future, but also whether it's primarily around you know, Chinese investors or whether you're targeting global investor base for your trading activities? Well, trading, of course, is becoming a very, very big part of our industry. Trading was not that prevalent 25, 30 years ago. And it changed, it's, it's in, in, in many ways, the ability to trade that, that has really uh, had an impact on how we do business. As an example, where um, because of our ability to, to sell the aircraft today, we are more... Um, we're, we're more prone or we're, we're less uh, cautious doing a larger orders, as example, where you will not just let the concentration risk or the singular minister to making those decisions. You, you become common to say when you, when you, when you do a, a, a larger deal, you will say, well, how tradable, uh, you know, other than just the risk and other than just the, the rent levels and, and um, so it, it has a huge impact, I think, in how we think in doing business today, as you know. And it's very important also because it's a valve, again, that we all observe this. Right now the selling market is still robust. We think it's coming towards the end of it soon, but it is still robust. It's been robust for some time now. I suppose the, the flip side of the robust trading market is all the new liquidity and new capital that's come into the industry. You know, you've talked a bit about whether you think we're coming to the, you know, the, the, the tip of that, of that flow of capital. Do you think these new entrants are here to stay or do you think it's kind of fleeting capital? I'm fairly sure that they are, they are a cycle. I, uh, it's, we already seeing some signs of the new entrants of what I call the shallow root um, entities that are that are go away uh, as interest rate rises, and as the as the foreign exchange uh, situation in China, I think many of the investors which previously were in the aviation sector will leave will, will leave the second, and it, and it's probably would be a good thing. Okay. And speaking of um, China, obviously people are interested in whether or not being part of a, a sovereign bank, as you as you state, that is there much influence in terms of approvals or ordering that comes from the parent or kind of how independent are you as a business? I think this is a very, very good question because it, it um, one of the reasons that I accepted the job is that the CDB as senior uh, management is very clear of their conviction of wanting to create this entity that's global, international. And they know precisely what it means in terms of that 
in terms of how much they have to let go. Um, in terms of our operating environment now, CDB Aviation is a Irish entity, as you know. Um, in terms of our day-to-day -day operation, in terms of the systems, in terms of approval, or in terms of what we call macro approval process, it's all self-contained. Uh, we, we, we can place aircraft, we can buy aircraft, we could do sale lease specs. Um, all this is within the procedures as well documented that's within CDB aviation itself. There's no approval other than, info, other than that we go through our own board process. We have our investment committees, we have our subcommittee on the, on the, on the, on the uh, equivalents of transaction approval on the board level. And our governing ultimate governance comes from the board of CDB aviation. Now, when we, our financial relationship with our parents is a very unique one where we rely heavily or entirely on the, um, on the guarantee from our mothership. And in, that, in those cases, we, of course, we go, through the, we go through the process of requesting for additional funds. But otherwise, in terms of day-to-day -day operations, we're very, very, I'm very pleased and um, that's, I, I consider that one of our more important accomplishments between our shareholders and ourselves this year. When you look at the China-centric business, where you, I think currently over 50% of your fleet are in China, yet you're becoming global, yet the growth in aviation is clearly going to be also in China for the next 20 years. How are you, how are you balancing the, uh, the desire for a global presence with having, mm. having a presence and a, I suppose a, an, an angle into the Chinese market? Our mothership is singularly the biggest lender to all the Chinese airlines. So not to mention the CDB Bank infrastructural part of it that has helped out in terms of municipal levels and provinces and so on where most of the Chinese airlines are related in pedigree one way, one form or another um, to, to provinces and municipalities. So our relationship from a CDB family tree point of view is immense. So there's no question that we will always be a very Chinese-centric company while we very hurriedly go to Ireland established an international platform, but we know that our heritage is always in China. So that is, but th that is also one of the reasons why we, when we project our strategic allocations, we think that Asia Pacific will have approximately 50% of our entire, um, uh, in terms of a long-term planning, um, our fleet allocation, and we will, and we allocate our resources accordingly, in terms of the number of people, offices. Um, it will be, China will be maybe twenty five percent. The rest of Asia Pacific will be the other twenty five percent, maybe thirty percent in Europe, and the remaining twenty percent will be in Americas. And outside of Asia, I was when I looked at the fleet, I was surprised to see, I, I'm not sure if there's any aircraft in North America yet. Um, and obviously it's a very profitable part of the world at the moment. And do you see that as a, an, an outside of Asia, one of the big growth areas for you? Well, we competed in several big projects, um, Deltas and America, but it's just not enough fuel for us. <laughs> so we... We, we're anxious to do something with North American Airlines. I hope we do something very soon. Um, actually, we are, we are going to be very close to it. Uh, we have a very robust uh, American team. We have uh, new members who are excellent people that are uh, soon to join. So we're still on the, on the takeoff stage for our, for our America team, but we'll be there soon. Okay, interesting. And then, so you're already with the order positions well over 400 aircraft. Um, how do you see getting to 600? Is it more orders or um, sale and leasebacks or possibly some M&A activity? This leaves the sale leasebacks, as you say, and, and M&A. I think sale leaseback market, as we're doing, 
the, the, the yields are uh, poor because the market situation. We will do them. We have done uh, some this year, but we do it out of relationship reasons, not necessarily because of strategically, not just in terms of the revenue and returns. But the main part we hope uh, is M&A. We have a budget for, for M&A this year. We have uh, established a small platform to provide analytics and to provide support systems so we can do the job properly. So, so we are quite serious with M&A. If we just uh, go back slightly to, to, to funding, Mo most people at the moment in this competitive market talk about how essentially it's the liability side of the balance sheet that matters and the lowest cost of funds is, is needed to be able to compete. How, hey, how do you fund yourself and do you see it in, in terms of um, you know, bonds, secured, unsecured, will you go for an investment grade rating? How, how do you see CDB Aviation funding itself going forward? Well, currently, we really have two platforms in terms of funding. We have uh, in China, onshore, because we have 50 aircraft, and for placement into the Chinese uh, jurisdiction, naturally, we, we, we go to Tianjin, or we go to Shanghai, or we go to Xiamen, and where, where the funds are raised onshore. So, and in terms of offshore, we think we currently are basically 70-30. Um, 70 unsecured, and we, ha as you know, we have a very, very fortunate uh, situation where we, we have a very, very good, strong mothership. We have no reason to, to, to go into, to tap into a lot of other markets. So, so 70 percent unsecured, we issued a bond, we recently have raised uh, some, some very, very, very satisfying, we think very good tight rates. Uh, we'll probably continue to do that. Uh, for the short term, we have so many other more, er, more pressing things to do, such as some of the things I mentioned. Um, we, we will probably table the, the, the processes for investment grade for the time being, only because we don't see any practical reasons why we need to do it. And so the H&A group, I believe you're the bank and, and your own company has quite a few aircraft there. They seem to be making strides in terms of raising raising finance in, in other parts of their business. How how are you finding the, the process there? Well, the biggest mystery to H&A Group is transparency. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows. Um, we have some exposure there as, as, a, as a lessor, not the biggest. Uh, I think we rank sixth or seventh. Uh, last time I checked the list. Um, I think that it will be a process. Um, we, we look at it very closely. We have daily contact with them. Um, and we just, we just have to manage. I think in the end, um, the airline itself is going to be fine. They have a, they have a scale um, where if you just carve out the, the airline operation itself, um, it's, it's well managed. Um, it's a profitable business. It has a very strong positioning in the China market. And they have their weaknesses, of course. They have their troubles, such as the Hong Kong and so on. But, but by and large, they are healthy, um, healthy operation. So, so I think what they're going to find, we, 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 we will go through a period like we're going through it right now. So the question is, how do we get, once we get in the tunnel, at what point do we get out? And those are the things we've paid a lot of attention to. And in general, for the industry, how it's changed and where it's going, you know, what do you think its greatest challenges are uh, facing the industry? And indeed, you know, what keeps you awake at night for, for CDB Aviation as you try and grow, grow out the platform? Well, I, they keep me awake of how, how we place the 38 white bodies we have for the next lease like everyone else. In terms of macro level, I think one of the things for the industry is, is education. Um, I, uh, I went to a GPA reunion a month ago and we all toasted happily that, that the alums from GPA were on the senior level of our industry by a significant percentage. 
And that to me is an indication that we really haven't had a platform or educational institution that has the right um, architecture to, to continue to develop the leadership for the next generation. And hiring people, I, we, as I said, we've been very, very fortunate to be, to be able to recruit well. And, but I don't think that's the norm. I think, I think we were just lucky. Um, and I think as an industry, we all need to chip in and, and, and do something you know, large and small to, to, con to, to make it, number one, to recognize its issue and to keep a higher awareness to, have, again, everybody chip in, where we will have a platform, a mechanism that will continue to generate the next generation of, of managers for our business. I think that's probably the biggest, biggest uh, industry challenge. Peter, thank you very much. You're welcome. I think it's been a really insightful interview. Thank you for all your comments. And to all our audience, we hope that we will see you all at ISTAT in Asia and Singapore. That's in May. And the next issue of this Aviation Insight podcast and video should be out uh, late summer, just in time for the ISTAT EMEA event in Prague at the end of September 2018. Thank you very much.